In July 1786, with her popularity at an all-time low, Marie Antoinette gives birth to her last child, Sophie Beatrice. Just 11 months later, the infant dies. The ordeals multiply for this loving mother, and now the health of the Dauphin, heir to the throne, is declining. He suffers from bone tuberculosis, which causes him terrible pain. One year before the revolution, Marie Antoinette takes her family on a last summer retreat to the Petit Trianon. There are few festivities. Her heart is not in it. Political realities can no longer be kept at a distance. The Petit Trianon, like the Queen's Hamlet, isolates Marie Antoinette more and more from reality. Even what she sees from her window is just a sort of theater. Holed up inside her estate, she doesn't see the ideological revolution taking place. She doesn't hear of the new ideas promoted by the men of the Enlightenment, nor does she hear the rumblings in the capital growing closer to Versailles. In the mid-1780s, the French Treasury's accounting books were made public for the first time, and the French people were shocked to discover that the crown was running a gigantic deficit. Marie Antoinette, even though she was living a bucolic life, uh, mostly away from the splendor and formality of court, became a convenient lightning rod for public anger about how broke the crown was. She was being reviled in the French press as Madame Deficit. Marie Antoinette reduces her spending at home. Gambling and games are forbidden in the salons. She cuts back on the stables. She lets go of Madame Bertin. But these efforts go virtually unnoticed amidst the general turmoil, and it is too late anyway. Too late is the phrase that will describe all of her efforts. The financial crisis was only worsened by an indecisive king. Councillors pulled him in opposing directions. The government ground to a halt. A vacuum was forming in the heart of the monarchy, a vacuum that would inevitably draw Marie Antoinette back to the chateau. The queen has dishonored herself. This is how the French people see Marie Antoinette. The queen is the target of all accusations. She has become a martyr queen, which is how the myth is born. All the blame is put on her, much more than on Louis XVI. The queen can no longer turn her back on the growing crisis. For the first time, she enters politics, inviting Jacques Necker, a popular finance minister dismissed by the king years earlier, to sort out the problems of the treasury. A letter addressed to the Austrian ambassador finds her resigned but determined. I have written to Mr. Necker, asking him to come here tomorrow. There is no time to waste. The sooner he begins working, the better. The situation is urgent. I tremble, forgive me my weakness. It is I who seek to bring him back. It is my fate to bring bad luck. And if the infernal machinations cause him to fail again or to weaken the authority of the king, they will hate me even more. Necker will not prove the savior she hopes for. The Estates General, a national convention called by the king to resolve the issue of taxation, convenes in May 1789. It will become the vehicle for revolution. Just one month after the sitting of the Estates General, on the night of June the 3rd, 1789, personal tragedy compounds political crisis. The Dauphin, Louis-Joseph, Marie Antoinette's seven-year-old son, dies. The Estates General refuses to acknowledge the king's pain. There is no pause in the proceedings.
If there was a single time the king broke his word and came to the queen's domain unannounced, it might have been this moment, when the outlines of their shared destiny first took shape in the gathering gloom. Marie Antoinette's last day at Versailles. Never again will she see her secret refuge. After 19 years, she again confronts the palace she has neither conquered nor escaped. Of her family, only her daughter, Madame Royale, will survive the revolution. Meek will be guillotined. Rose Bertin will find exile in London. Fersen will be murdered by a Swedish mob. And the hamlet will be saved by the Queen's gardener, Antoine Richard, loyal to the end. As for the House of the Queen, it will wait over two centuries for the renovation that revives its original splendor. Like every tale of destiny, Versailles and Marie Antoinette is a story that does not end. It is fulfilled. <laughs>